So originally I was going to come and talk to you about why I had chosen to organize a conference about such an obscure and niche topic. <laughs> At first I told Evo I thought maybe 70 people would show up and sit down for an all-day conference. I mean like anarchists, they'll come to the, you know, parties, 30 or 40 people come to the benefits at Silent Barn, but like who's going to sit through the whole thing? So it turned out over 1,300 people responded on Facebook as being interested or going. One person is apparently even coming from Croatia to come here. And so after this, I thought to myself, what have I done? <laughs> a reporter who was writing about this conference, okay, a reporter, does, reporters don't usually write about anarchist conferences. He said, why is there so much interest in Yiddish speaking anarchism? And so I told him, I have no idea. <laughs> okay, well, at least I do have some ideas. And I'll share my own idea with you, especially since I'm probably the only person here with this specific take, but this is why the conference happened. At a previous Evo class and talk on Jewish anarchists, the latter of which I had criticized from the audience, Evo's head, Jonathan Brent, who just spoke, reached out to me, and he asked my thoughts on how a broader range of people could get involved in Evo. Okay, I'm a middle-aged white guy. If you're asking a middle-aged white guy about how more people like him can get involved, your organization may have a legacy problem. So Jonathan was particularly interested in having anarchists and radical Jews feel part of the YIVO community and to come to the programs here. Now, if you don't know this, most organizations are really interested in how to keep anarchists and radicals out of their spaces. <laughs> I'm a little more friendly than the other people in the anarchist scene. I frequently try to get mainstream groups to work with anarchists, and it's nearly impossible. I've even coined a word for this. It's the A word. Once you say it, people hang the phone up and run away. And now we have two word, A words, we have, anti, we have Antifa and Anarchist, so. So I was flabbergasted that Jonathan was interested in this. We met for lunch, the diner around the corner, and I brought him a stack of recently published books, many of which are for sale outside, about Yiddish-speaking anarchists, and some of which were based on research done here at the Yivo's own archives. I explained there had been a renaissance in anarchist studies in the academy, and now there was an unprecedented number of anarchist professors. There were also a number of independent anarchists and, or independent intellectuals, including myself, who have doctorates, but we're running a muck in society rather than being safely locked up in the academy, which has an overcrowding problem, if you haven't heard. So um, uh, these have given today's anarchist and anti-fascist milieus a much more sophisticated and intellectual approach, and unsurprisingly, many of us are Jewish or from Jewish family backgrounds. So at lunch, at this lunch, I presented Jonathan with a list of 18 talks that I'd like to see at Evo, starting with an all-day, one-day, all-day anarchist conference on Yiddish-speaking anarchists. And to my shock, he accepted me the offer on the spot. We walked back to Evo, upstairs to the office. He introduced me to his staff, and then he told them they were going to help me organize this conference. <laughs> there, there was a, they gave me a look. Actually, there were two looks. The first one was, anarchists? And the second one was, who is this guy that Jonathan's dragged off the street? <laughs> I assured them I had done conferences before, and furthermore, there really were other people interested in this topic, and I do hope I have been true to my word. So people have come here to learn about the Yiddish-speaking anarchist for a variety of reasons, and I would guess that there are um, four most likely suspects. Um, actually, I don't know, if you're not one of these four things, please come up to me afterwards and tell me, because I really do want to know why you're here. <laughs> one, there's the historically minded who are curious about this part of Jewish history and New York history. Um, that has, as Jonathan said, until recently been almost completely ignored. One of the few things that Marxists and liberal academics can agree on is both of them wish that anarchists had never existed, <laughs> either in the past or in the present. And boy, can I tell you some, I went to the Graduate Center, boy, can I tell you some stories about Marxist professors having talks and talking about like historical figures and they mention all the figures and their politics and everything. When it comes to the anarchists, they just say their names and keep going. <laughs> Anarchist. Um, second, the Yiddish, the Yiddishist crowd um, may be the ones most likely to already know about this tradition since they can read the existing materials. I mean, the old uh, papers, the Fry Arbiter Stone stuff, are available at La um, you know, Labadee or Tamman or the other archives, and they're probably looking to learn more about a movement that they might already know something about from primary sources. Three, radical Jews who reject Zionism 
um, are probably interested in Yiddish anarchism because they're looking at a variety of historical alternatives which they can ransack for materials in their quest to build a new, positive, radical Jewish identity. And this, I think, goes hand in hand with the revival of Bundism, which I'm also interested in, and the Bund's archives are here, and there's been several um, very good presentations and classes about Bundist history here. Of course, people who are specifically anarchists, including I'm sure many people in this room, are interested in looking at the Yiddish anarchist current as they try and figure out what a specifically anarchist Jewish identity might look like today. And I would guess that some of this is fueled by an exhaustion with the role of the anti-Zionist Jew, which unfortunately is the only Jewish identity that's on offer in the radical left today. And while there's nothing wrong with this, it's a purely negative thing, which is nothing positive to say about Jewish identity or tradition, and people, even who are firm anti-Zionist, I think want to have a more affirmative role about their Jewish identity. Four, lots of anarchists, including many who are not from Jewish backgrounds, are lar interested in the largely forgotten history of their own political tradition. As this conference will discuss, the left-wing anarchist movement in the United States was originally a, pretty much an immigrant affair. The early US anarchists were divided into different language groups, uh, into different groups, but they were divided by language and not by ethnicity. And so in the US, there were Russian, German, Spanish, Yiddish, Italian, Chinese, French, Japanese, and other anarchist-speaking scenes. And each group then had their own newspapers, they had their, their own uh, groups, and their own meeting places sometimes. And so this is why this is a conference today about Yiddish-speaking anarchists and not about Jewish anarchists. Some of the people we'll be speaking about weren't Jewish at all, including famously Rudolf Rocker. Um, and we would have put together quite a different conference if it had been about Jewish anarchism. So if you look at today's New Yorks, I don't know who lives in New York or is active in the, um, in the anarchist milieu here. In the anarchist punk scene today, the, it's the, it looks like this today. It's divided into two scenes, an Anglophone scene and the Latino punk scene that's Spanish speaking. Uh, the latter is a largely immigrant milieu and the barrier to participating in it is largely linguistic. It's not about your ethnicity. I mean, anyone can go to the shows, but that's how the divide goes down. And I think it's very similar to the divides in the past. So I have, however, of those four things, my own specific interest in Yiddish speaking anarchism. And here's where either half is going to go over half the heads of half the people, and half of you are going to love this, and the other half are going to boo me. <laughs> so I'm agnostic about anarchism itself. Um, I, in particular, I'm not swayed by anarchism's best known feature, which is the wholesale rejection of the state, although I do agree the state cannot be the mechanism of a revolutionary transformation. I do strongly believe that a libertarian socialist approach has important things to offer the world. And I believe that any serious form of libertarian socialism, which is one to the left of social democracy and two is not a dialect of Marxism, will have to engage with anarchism as its starting point no matter where it ends up. Um, and that's because anarchism has always been the main libertarian socialist current in my mind. So as the Yiddish speaking anarchist Rudolf Rocker said, anarchism is a combination of the best of socialism and liberalism. And this is necessary because as Mikhail Bakunin, the founding theoretician of classical anarchism, and also a vicious anti-Semite, I know, <laughs> said freedom without socialism is privilege and injustice, and socialism without freedom is slavery and brutality. And what he said was true in the 1800s, and it's true today. So I wrote my dissertation up at the CUNY Graduate Center um, about anarchist theory in the United States after 1960, and I focused what were the theoretical implications on the shift between classical and contemporary anarchism. And if you've never suffered through graduate school, let me assure you, you are not supposed to do this. If you want to write about something radical, you should make sure it is long dead and buried. If you have tenure, you can do it, and they still don't like it when you do this. The classical anarchist tradition is roughly 100 years spanning from 1840 when Proudhon published What is Property until 1939 when the uh, Spanish Republic finally fell and the anarchists were defeated militarily by Franco. And it is true that classical anarchist theory is no blend of German philosophy, English political economy, and French socialism, as one Russian radical said. But, counter to the last person who spoke here, Evo, on anarchism, classical anarchism does have a far more sophisticated and coherent set of theoretical beliefs than most people realize. And it has the great advantage of consistently refusing to value either freedom or justice over the other. So um, most people who are interested in mining this body of thought, and maybe I'm showing my age here, this was maybe more of a discussion in the 90s and 0s, um, agree, who like classical anarchist theories, agree they need to be updated. Uh, but there is no agreement about how this updating should be done. Now, if you've ever spent time around anarchists, this isn't going to come as any surprise. If people here think that uh, two Jews, three opinions is too much, come to the anarchist book fair in New York sometime. <laughs> Just... 
I mean, I run security for the book fair usually, and I got to tell you, it's a pain every, every year. We don't run security for the anarchist infightings, just for the fascists, um, who do show up. And so, but overall, neither anarchist activists nor academics nor people who are both have engaged in some kind of reassessment and revision of classical anarchist beliefs. What's happened instead is contemporary anarchists um, have kept a loose adherence to the p political conclusions set up by the classical anarchists. I'm going to exclude, I was thinking of this after I wrote this, I'm going to exclude syndicalists from this because they have a bit of a different track, but so this is about the rest of anarchists. However, so they keep this loose framework when it comes to specific questions, and these are particularly, um, it's particularly uh, clear on questions of identity, nationalism, imperialism, colonialism, and anti-Zionism. Anarchists have simply inserted critiques that they've taken from other theoretical traditions with little or no revision into their thought. And this is true even when these ideas directly conflict with core anarchist positions on the state of nationalism, on means ends congruency, and about being against all forms of, of oppression, and in particular when this involves anti-Semitism. This is so bad I invented my own slogan for this. It's called Against All Oppression, Some Exceptions Apply. <laughs> we'll be fair, I, and I know some people are here on the anarchist academics list who have been through this, these fights with me and everyone else, and it's probably like, oh, I've heard Spencer say this already. So, uh, To be fair, anarchists are no worse than any, part, uh, any other part of the left about this, and they are better than some others. I mean, there's, it's not a place where the real stinkers are. Um, but in general, I gotta say, the left is, uh, people aren't gonna say to you this in an anarchist space or left space, but this is a Jewish space. The left is awful on this issue, and it pains me to sit down with Evo volunteers and tell them I'm a radical leftist, and they go, oh, the left is anti Semitic. I mean, somebody did something to earn that reputation. So, left anti Semitism is nowhere as near bad as the right portrays it, but it is a consistent and almost entirely unaddressed problem. This is one of my other pet, pet areas of interest. So back to anarchist theory. The problem with incorporating hot takes from other political traditions into an anarchist framework is they're usually based in firmly authoritarian ontologies and epistemologies, and this is particularly cr true on questions of identity and imperialism. So in my reading, the difference between post-1960 US anarchism and that of the classical era is this, that classical anarchists were consistent in trying to figure out their political positions by looking through a libertarian socialist onto epistemological lens and were committed to doing this. They would not accept views that did not fall within that. Today, anarchists seem to borrow doctrines that Marxist-Leninists, revolutionary nationalists, and post-structuralists have left lying around and are now just up for grabs. This ends up with anarchists espousing things like an inverted hierarchy that advocates the leadership of certain categories of people who have suffered oppression, or a revanchist nationalism based on blood and soil doctrines, or a simplistic politics which divides the world between oppressed and oppressor nations, both internally and externally. No one's thrown anything yet, okay. So to me, when anarchists, as well as all libertarian socialists in general, ask the question, how should a specific issue be approached, our first instinct should be to ask how have anarchists and other libertarian socialists approached this question in the past? Because they are the ones who insisted that their formulations be kept within an internally consistent existing framework that had a dual commitment to freedom and justice. So we're coming back to the conference. We cannot incorporate this history if we do not know what they thought, and we cannot know what they thought if A, we don't read the languages that they wrote in, because I'm a monolingual English speaker like many native-born white Americans, um, and B, there is no English language secondary scholarship about these beliefs. And that brings us back here. What did Yiddish-speaking anarchists think about racial and ethnic identity, nationalism, Zionism, and imperialism? I'm pretty sure the scholars who've come here today will provide us, including myself, with some of these answers. So I've helped organize, organize the conference for this reasons, because I see it as an attempt to um, rescue anarchist history, which can revitalize anarchist theory, which might in turn contribute to a larger, workable, and ontologically and epistemologically consistent libertarian socialist theory and politic. I am deeply pessimistic in general. As I get older, I really think Sartre is right. Hell is other people. <laughs> and it may, in fact, be hell may be other anarchists. <laughs> But I also think a libertarian socialist approach I've outlined has a real potential as a kind of combination of doikite and tikkun alum, because here where we live, things are deeply broken and they're really in need of repair. So I have three unconnected things to end with. The first is this is a rare conference in a mainstream institution where anarchists are not gonna be treated like either bugs or antiques. We will not be the object of hostile, of, we will not be the object of analysis by hostile criminologists or unsympathetic Marxists. 
once in a while you do get a sy sympathetic Marxist like Heather Gottney, but rare, rare is the person. Uh, Kenyon Zimmer and I, the conference co-organizer, have done our best to make sure this conference is going to be the good shit, real high-quality anarchist scholarship. And I'm going to tell you, there is sometimes a dearth of this, and this ain't going to be what this is. This conference is also happening in dialogue with New York City's anarchist community. On that note, I would like to invite everybody to the after party at the East River Bar. It is at 97 South 6th Street in South Williamsburg, near the Marcy JMZ. The after party is an unofficial event, not connected to YIVO, but it is sponsored by MAC, the Metropolitan Anarchist Coordinating Council, the New York IWW, the New York City Anarchist Book Fair, and MUJU, the Muslim Jewish Anti-Fascist Front, and I, other conference speakers, and hopefully you will join us there. Also $4 paps. <laughs> Second, Yiddish-speaking anarchists did not only live in the remote past, and those who've been directly influenced by them are probably younger than you might think. So I'm going to give you uh, four examples of people that I personally or my friends knew. Um, some people here, I'm guessing, may have known Clara and Sidney Solomon, who mentored many Long Island teenage anarchists in the 1990s, a number of whom now are in their 40s and are active um, writers and activists in the milieu. Audrey Goodfriend, who I believe died in 2003, was close to many of the Oakland post-left anarchists and insurrectionists, including the staff of AJODA, Anarchy, a Journal of Desire Armed. If you looked at the, watched the magazine in the O's in early teens and there was an old woman who was a t-shirt model, that was Audrey. Um, and she, actually way back in the day, had been in a group with Sam Dolgoff. So of course, Esther and Sam Dolgoff were close to many anarchists in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, some of whom I'm sure are also here today. And their son, Anatoly Dolgoff, will speak more about his influential parents in the co conference's keynote speech. Second, if you're interested in Yiddish or the secular Jewish community, I encourage you to participate in it. Just like with anarchism, it is a participatory practice. I volunteer here at the Center for Jewish History, and which is partly how this all came about, and I would like to invite others also to get involved in the city's vibrant secular Jewish community. And I specifically want to extend this invitation to two kinds of people. One, I know many of you out there have some Jewish family background. It's your dad, or you grew up in a totally secular family. Um, but this has never been a major part of your identity, and you probably have little contact with the organized Jewish community. If you would like to have more, the door is open. Um, they don't bite, and this is one of the fabulous places that you can get involved in. I especially also want to extend this invitation to people who have no Jewish family background. Um, I would like to point out, point out that several of the conference participants, including my co-organizer and Yiddish speaker, Kenyon Zimmer, are not from Jewish backgrounds. And to me, this is really heartening. Because well, the way I look at it, the world is obsessed with Jews. <laughs> Jews, anti-Semitism, Israel, it's constantly on the front page of every newspaper, it's constantly talked about far and way beyond any actual numbers, influence, or real world, 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 real world doings. But despite this, the vast majority of people have no interest in learning anything about Jewish history, about the many Jewish languages, because there's not just Yiddish and Hebrew, there's Ladino, there's Judeo-Arabic, or really anything else about really existing Jews or Jewish history or the Jewish community. They talk about Jews all the time, and they don't want to know anything real. So I ask you to please help change that. I can't speak for anyone, but from my perspective, the litmus test for participating in New York City's secular Jewish community is neither ethnic nor religious. It is simply, are you interested in learning more about Jewish life and participating in it? And I'll point out, all of you by sitting here are already doing this. So last, I want to th the, the, the uh, obligatory thanks. I want to thank Kenyon Zimmer, Zimmer, who graciously agreed to co-organize this conference with me and did a fabulous job. I would like to thank all the speakers who will be introduced separately. I'd like to thank Christine Kiertnitsky and Eric Larson, whose objections to the previous YIVO presentation set the wheels in motion for this. I would like to thank Sharona, Julie, and Christine for moderating, Sharona and Moisha for the after party, and everybody else who stepped up to volunteer. I'd like to thank Claire Ehrlich, who did last week's Jewish Currents interview with three scholars of Jewish anarchism, Tony Michaels, who was originally scheduled to speak, and on behalf of YIVO and the conference organizers, I send best wishes and healing thoughts to his family. I'd like to thank the two designers who did great work for us, Dan Sideradsky and Chris, who did the After Party logo. Dan did the wonderful conference logo with the flag. Um, I'd like to thank the EVO staff, including Alex, Jessica, Jen, Bain, Ben, Eddie, and Eddie for Center for Jewish History, and special thanks to Jonathan Brent and Alex Weiser, without whom there would be no conference.
So finally, I want to thank everyone here today for sharing with me what I thought was, until now, a very obscure interest in mine. It makes me happy that it turns out that the pre-war Yiddish-speaking anarchists are not so forgotten after all. So thank you all, and I hope we have a great conference.